Brent Terry is the author of four collections of poetry and a novel, The Body Electric. His most recent book of poems, 20th Century Autoimmune Blues, was published this year by Unsolicited Press. Terry has published poems, stories, essays, plays, and journalism in dozens of periodicals around the world. His poetry has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, two Best of the Net Awards, and inclusion in Bettering American Poetry. The Body Electric was nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award. He has won a fellowship from the Connecticut Arts Board and won the 2018 Connecticut Poetry Prize. Hi, my name is Telena Thomas. I've spent the last three months in Professor Terry's Introduction to Creative Writing class. In this short amount of time, I truly believe that I have advanced as a writer. I've learned so many new styles and writing techniques. Professor Terry's course has inspired me to switch my major from criminology to English, giving me the opportunity to pursue a career path that caters to my skill set and makes me happy. I failed to introduce myself before, but I am Richie Gumpert. I will be graduating in just a few weeks with my degree in English and certification in secondary education. While I have now already survived my undergraduate adventure, I'm extremely grateful uh, for Professor Terry for being a part of my journey towards the very end. He has unleashed a creative spirit in me that I didn't quite know I had, redefining the very relationship I feel I have with poetry. And I see the same process with all the students who have the pleasure to work with him. We are honored to have him here with us today. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, before I start reading, I just want to thank a few people. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Donnie, Dr. Taracchio, um, for one, for just being always being there for me um, and incredibly supportive, and for you know helping make Creative Ragged and Eastern the exciting um, adventure it is. Um, I'd like to thank Miranda and Sarah, the English department, for making this happen. Um, the folks from the bookstore, um, and, and all of you. Um, some of these poems I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be flashing um, a piece of art up as, as I do it. Um, I do a lot of ekphrastic writing, which means writing in response to another art, in this case, paintings. Um, and I'm working with a wonderful Canadian artist named Lorette Luzajic on a project where I respond to some of her paintings. She paints in response to some of my poems. They're all square, album cover size, so ideally the book that comes out of this will be a beautiful art book that's the size of a, an album cover. And if Third Man, Jack White's publishing house can do it and put an album in there, that would be great. So if anybody knows Jack White, let me know. All right, I'm gonna get started. And then, so some of those art Poems are in the book, and some of them are not. Um, but here we go. This one's called The Addictive Futility of Hope. The Addictive Futility of Hope is what she calls her latest installation, which is mainly bees on leashes and fading plastic poppies. The best art is collaboration between people and nature, she says like Smithson's spiral jetty or a tornado doing a tarantella with a barn. She steals the fake flowers from the cemetery out by the interstate, leaves pots of black-eyed Susans beneath the stones. She says that a stalk of wheat driven through a fence post by a twister tells us all we need to know about God. She says the membrane is permeable, but only in one direction. Every morning, she catches bees in the field of wild flowers behind her house. Every evening, she lets them go. She says the last song on every record is a forlorn buzzing, says just watching the shopping carts drift across rain-slick asphalt can make her cry. She trembles sometimes when a lover touches her face, as if a storm means the drought is over, she says as if touching leaves us any less alone, as if bees did e ever did anything but hurt us, but love us, as if their stings are nearly penance enough. This next one
is um, a happy little poem about dying of anaphylactic shock. Um, I, I used to carry an EpiPen everywhere because I was afraid. But it's not the first sting that gets you, it's the next one. And of course, the second sting, I didn't have my EpiPen with me. And I was 20 miles on a trail I'm like, oh, I'm not going to die. This is great. And I wrote, wrote a poem about it, sort of. Death at the food truck rodeo. Oh, how like love to be stung by the first bee of summer. The stab, the electric thrum that numbs your fingers, dispatches your lemonade earthward. The burrito anointed in sweet green chili, now a part of your ensemble. Bespattered by the divine, your EpiPen on top of the dresser, next to your cufflinks and copy of Howl. Your friends are still en route, your love in Duluth. Be still dangling from the webbing between your forefinger and thumb. And what you need, you think, is to sink to your knees among the tender young tufts between falafel kingdom and the burrito bandito. To be floored by the hive, bun, hive buzz blossoming of tinnitus, the shouts of children, the caffeinated strum and brass of mariachis, the fading chorus of faces stuffed with dough. You were bewitched by the shadows of leaves, hand-painted signs for Cubanos y Coca-Cola, the acid trip eight-foot radioactive habanero lacerating the aluminum skin of the taco truck across the green. It all starts to prism, to whirl, the whole panorama bright as fruit and booze in a blender. You try to swallow, to speak. Your lips attempt to wrap themselves around a bee or goodbye. Here on earth, your back is caressed by green tendrils, but you are beginning to bob, to balloon yourself cloudward. Fluid fills your fingers and your lungs. The sky fills with helium, a high-pitched holy hollering. It's only love, and thus the birds commence with their elegies and elaborate dances. Your grandmother warbles a tune she sang when you were just a boy. Your lover whispers hush, then ghosts your lips with kisses. Some new music, systemic as summer, as anaphylaxis, now courses through your body like cotton candy or fire. You are a world. You orbit yourself. You're so full of life you could explode into a billion hyacinths, and then you do. All righty, this one has no painting yet. And it is the first poem in the book. Um, I write a lot of social, political type of poems. I'm not going to read a ton of those here today, but this is one of them. Um, it's about a certain wall that's still being erected, as far as I know. Um, and it's also about the idea, opposing idea, that right now we can't write about anything but political stuff because it doesn't matter, which is not true either. And this sort of tries to combine those two things into one. It's called, they told me I couldn't write about birds and flowers anymore, what with all the injustice in the world. And there's an epigraph by Robert Frost, something there is that doesn't love a wall. In Arizona, in Texas, from desert dust it rises, from barrel cactus and Christmas agate it grows, from the bleached bones of javelina, the rib cages of a mother and twin girls from Chahul. It is Ozymandias, it is April and the lupins shoot their purple arrows through the husks of cars, globe mallow, desert senna, Mojave spurge and brittlebush have their own notion of freedom. Bird song goes wherever the it pleases. Green jay, chachalaca, bob white proclaiming its name. Wintering western meadowlark sings a migration song, wings its way toward Wyoming above Tacomas loaded with slim jims and zip-tied Salvadorans. Was there a time before beauty was ironic, when bloom was not torment, bird song not yet taunt? To the north, the broccoli flowers, and rots in the fields uncut. I hope this blood flower, this primrose, this 
Indian paintbrush won't spoil the poem. This Gila woodpecker, this Chipa Amarillo, this Inca dove. This one's a little late for, for Easter, but um, it is, was written for my um, late brother who died a long time ago when he was 20 and I was 30, but I was watching a rainstorm out my window looking at over the mills and the river um, at, the garden, from, uh, at the garden bridge in, in Willimantic and um, during a rainstorm. And uh, it's called The Torrent is a Harbinger. Raining again, and beneath my window, and between my window and the pink Victorian across the river hangs a curtain of concrete lace. Through its folds, the abandoned thread mills dissolve, reconstitute themselves as lofts, as studios, where as we speak, painters in Nirvana t-shirts and spattered jeans shout color at canvas, cry and hue that until this moment existed only as rumor, delicious as whispered, trickled tongue to ear from one grizzled relic to another, rocking westward like spice trade troubadours conjuring the impossibility of cardamom from pockets of silk. The river thunders with snow melt, the bones of ruined works raising a havoc of current and froth. I want to smash something until it sings. I want to set the choir loft alight, speak in tongues that torch the silent tabernacle where winter kneels, worrying its beads and murmuring. I want to sing you back, little brother, from the dead. Every blossom bursts from a rupturing, and from my chest these bulbs scream your tulips out into the innocent air. Silver hammers pound their syllables of rain into my skull. Who knows what riot provokes the painter's hand, deft thrust into a puddle of a lazarin crimson, spasm of some rare blue, the incendiary stroke, the cinnamon whiff, vibrato that throbs from brain to brush, bristles igniting a furious bloom. Thank you. This is the title poem. It's called 21st Century Autoimmune Blues. Autoimmune disease is more and more prevalent all the time um, due because a lot of people are getting sick and they don't know what it is for a long time and then it's sort of figured out and a lot of environmental causes due to pollution, food additives, who knows what, um, heredity. So this is sort of riffing on my own adventure with that. 21st century autoimmune blues. Even the flowers are trying to kill you. Even the bread. Even the cells in your nails conspire to drag your hands to your neck <clears throat> and wrap and enrapture your song encrusted throat. Your fingers make palpable the shadow that seethes beyond the earth's voracious curve, plays the blues that Ripple that tipple the sin tender flesh. It's a brand new year, and histamines are all the rage. Corticosteroids are the new black. You've become allergic to yourself. It's body versus antibody, that same tired tango, and it's way too late for dancing. Your twisted mister blinks back from the bathroom mirror, doesn't bother to floss. Your future is encrypted in the walls of your bone vault. You bury your feelings, but have to admit that things are getting grave. The tossed postures of your everyday play shadow puppets on the kitchen wall, Punch and Judy headlining the Armageddon room. So you spend what's left of your youth laughing into your cry. Your eyes itch. It's just your body trying to kill you to save you from yourself. You're caught between a rock and a hardly place. You're going to name your new band Systemic Inflammatory Response. Your new album, What's Been Eating You Lately? Maybe it's tick-borne, maybe a fungus, maybe you're a character in a DeLillo novel. 
Your affliction is so postmodern. You're so meta. It's killing you. All right. Lighten it up just a little bit. Sort of, kind of. This one is about suddenly realizing you're not as young as you used to be, but um, I'm sure I'll realize that someday. And, but, and, and this really happened s sort of in Target one day. And it's called, On Encountering a Rack of Hogwarts Panties at Target, the Husband Has an Existential Crisis. You need a pillow for the couch, a lampshade. It's 10 minutes until closing, so you take a shortcut through the acres of undies, and both of you are brought up short in a cartoon bazaar of cotton and silk, startled by the plethora of underthings, candy-colored and licensed, archipelago of unmentionables adorned with Harley Quinn, and Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, Power Rangers, and Powder Puff Girls. Hogwarts has an island all its own, Hangers slung with the come hither of Slytherin boy briefs, trimmed in green and mockery. Crimson and gold Gryffindor hipsters hang all holier than thou and buddy. You can rest assured you will never be smart enough, brave enough, wizard enough to fathom whatever magic they might conceal. Nor young enough. No, never again, and you can feel your face redden as you turn away from the rack from which bikinis dangle, bedecked with the Hogwarts crest, navy with maroon, or maroon with navy, depending, you tell your love, on whether the games are home or away. You both chuckle in your middle-aged underclothes, but you sense the flickering of long-ago flames. They flare unbidden, flashing their ironic underoos from candlelit rooms of yesteryear, a little bit drunk, cracking jokes about spells and magic wands until your love says, Honey, you're sweating. Are you okay? Moments later, safe among the throw pillows, your faces lit by a hundred flashing televisions, it hits you. The perfection of Deadpool boxers and Captain America briefs of Wonder Woman bloomers like magic lassos for the libidos of the unsuspecting, undergarments exactly as glorious, as ludicrous, as the genitals they are woven to conceal. And then, it's the witching hour. You're instructed to bring all items to the register, so having decided on the purple pillow with polka dots, you begin to make your way to the front of the store. But in the aisle between men's accessories and lingerie, you stop. Casually, you pluck a pair of Harry Potter boxers from the rack, drop them into your cart. Your love cackles, grabs a pair of homes, a pair of aways. You howl low like a wolf. And on the wall, the big screen TVs seem to have changed channels all by themselves. Every last one wears the face of Nina Simone, and she's singing, I put a spell on. All right, Tinkerbell gone bad. Um, and notice, if you can, how much she looks like Miley Cyrus. Um, and this one is one I responded to the painting. And I made the huge mistake, you guys have heard this before, of, of I, I asked the painter, I said, is that Miley Cyrus? And she's like, I don't think so, I don't know. So I made the huge mistake of Googling Miley Cyrus nude unless you want to go down a really, really deep rabbit hole, don't Google my, Miley Cyrus nude. I didn't see this one, though, so I don't think it's her. Anyway, Tinkerbell gone bad. God made, this is a persona poem as well, from the point of view of Tinkerbell. God made me from Miley Cyrus's rib, deemed me wee, winged, wicked. Lush, my pixie dust gets all the lost boys high. They fly like puppies, a frisky litter of fits and starts. Pheromones waft down from their loosey-goosey formations, pollinate my woods with mortality and adolescent funk. I am pink, punk, pouting, naked as a wrecking ball, nary a f to give. 
But then Pete leaves and I descend into the real anguish of imaginary beings. Our Lady of the Butterflies, Shepherdess of Cherubim, my throne a toadstool, my ponytail flick the prick that once drew blood. I am tiny, but my heart, my heart is titanic, a sunken ship. I breaststroke its broken chambers, drink deep, deep of its seething, its bitter pirate wine. Fairy light, effervescent, my floodgates unhinged, I let fly with belch and giggle, a twisted husk of sob. My yearnings become my armor, but who will protect the world from me? Wendy is beyond my reach, my ken, so I murder Disney princesses with a glance, feed them to the ticking that talks in my noggin, sing crocodile rock as I pick my teeth with their bones. Petey, my pixie dust, it got you high, and now you're never coming down. But still I stare at the sky between the leaves, still I sing these old time ditties, so we might find one another in our dreams. Second star on the right, my love, straight on till morning. All right. This one's called Prom. It's about prom. Prom, I, it, I, I grew up on, in Denver, West Denver, so I was like right on the edge of mountains and plains and this one takes place a little out on the plains. By the third time I burst into flames, my date had become adept with the extinguisher. Untroubled was she by the arpeggios of foam, the retardant lavender fog, strapless and purple with polka dots, she was beset by rum and giggles. The cornfield scrolled past, coughed up a strange new alphabet, dank lingo from which, which we composed post-punk odes to famous firebugs, our high-speed chase choreographed by the screeching of nighthawks, the dumbstruck bunnies twitching in the brush by the ditch. Sunset outbursts haloed upwards like Billy Idol snarled their garbled weld schmerz from beyond the, behind the big-ass clouds. Lightning strafed the cornrows, and we were overcome Petrichor and nostalgia. Dada doodads abounded in the antique shops, but hey, what did we know? It was 81, maybe 82, so her hair was stratospheric, her dress lavender, my tux, the canary in the coal mine where the biggest diamond in history winked like a Bond girl from the seam. Thunderheads gnawed at the crust of the cheese pizza moon, dribbled lemonade down their knucklehead chins. My Buick, too, was yellow, combustible, fighter flighting every reflector flashing along the two-lane. On the windshield, the grasshoppers sacrificed themselves with a satisfying splat. In the rear view glittered the dance hall, which was really a burning barn. Everybody recognize that person? That's Madonna. Um, but she's holding a trident. So I cast her as um, Calypso from Greek mythology, who captured Odysseus and hung out with him for seven years. And then despite the fact that she was in love with him, she let him go home to Ithaca. And this is on the day that she watches him sail off. Splash Madonna, Calypso's song. Odysseus looks back, all buckle and swash from the prow of the boat we built, his feet bare upon the deck where I made love to him one last time. I tied him to the mast the way he liked, sang him beautiful stranger and lucky star. He gazes back now, unafraid. He's not Eurydice after all, nor Lot's wife, just the saltiest dog in the Tyrrhenian still irradiated with my immortal afterglow, still slick with my essential oils. I look good. Pencil skirt and trident smile, 
gun maw watching him vanish from the doorway of my speakeasy at the edge of the world. I feel nothing whatsoever like a virgin. I want you to want me, I whisper saying as he clears the jetty, tacks toward Ithaca and his crone. Cheap trick, I know, but I had to try. Holy mackerel, he cried the first time he saw me naked, buff from centuries in the gym. I taught him dance routines. He was a natural. All those years of capering, nimble in the rigging, supple with his dear dead boys, their high hopes and show tunes, their shining Apollonian eyes. At first, it was all pink sunsets and butterfly wings. But now, this mortal seven-year itch, the sea sings, I told you so. The wind freshens, blows my love forever from the cove. I can only reply, sadly, Papa don't preach. Anybody who know who that is? That's Patsy Cline, yes indeed. Um, so one of the great singers of all time, um, died young in a plane crash. But one of the founders of what became mainstream country music. Um, so uh, this painting's called, uh, this is one that the painting came from the poem. Um, and one of her famous songs is I Fall to Pieces. And that's what this one's called, except it's E-Y-E, Fall to Pieces. And, and one of the lines is, I fall to pieces um, each time someone speaks your name. I fall to pieces. Each time someone speaks your name, a mason, mason jar explodes. The face of the Madonna in the tomato springs a leak. Dry rot eats the hoses. The tool shed fills up fast with screaming and lightning and smoke. Thus are the pruning scissors left unfound, the potting soil spilled, roses amuck in my chest, hollering silly rabbit trips of her squids. Every Tuesday, my Tucson twang ices the donut oat at the open mic, howls like a southbound freight, uncorks a hootenanny of yodels, the odd coyote yip, a yawning year yearning for the peyote-soaked heebie-jeebies of yesteryear. Dude, that saguaro looks like your mom. Meanwhile, at the Opry, you're walking after midnight looking for a bottle opener, a banjo player, something to still this hillbilly hankering, that deep, sweet itch whispering from someplace untendered far too long. Every lonesome highway between me and you is rain slicked and moon frosted, the echoes of all those roadkill hearts thumping like tom-toms in the wheel well. Cradled like babies between shoulder and ear, our payphones play a busy signal serenade. On a napkin, I write you a poem called Fly to Me. Somewhere over Tennessee, the thunderheads are going crazy, crazy, crazy. Anybody know who this is? Jack White. Jack White. I love Jack White. This is called Jack Rabbit Heart. And there's a lot of a lot of white stripes and um, Jack White and and raconteur's lyrics in this one. Jack Rabbit Heart. Don't want to hear about it. Every single one has had their sitcom savaged by chrysanthemums. Everyone's chest X-ray has a Robert Johnson shaped throb. Thus the hours at the axe throwing arcade. Thus the fingertips gone from rosebud to callus to flame. When the monsters you make try to devalue, you throw down in a lazaretto. Impatient, inpatient, plague your kingpin, your all-girl henchman quarantined on the Isle of Man. Born rotten? Maybe so. But ain't you having a ball? A biscuit? A seventh son, seven-year twitch, slinging a seven-nation sing-along, a soccer stadium slam serenade. You can't decide. Blunderbuss or machine gun silhouette. Whiz-bang gym crack to slay the folks back home. Your boarding house reach is always exceeding your grasp, your jackrabbit heart always bleeding from your sleeve. 
They say you're a devil dying by the drop in a $3 hat, sharper than John Keats' shoulder blade, poison pen palling around down at some compuls consumptive crossroads. Death letter delivery, dead weather raconteur, dressed to kill in vampire overtones, your Victorian cheekbones way beyond the pale. You're all ears. Your blue vein, blue boutonniere bleeds out in hues that cry from your chest. Your fingers as electric as eels. All the feels gnashed in your blender and guzzled like lightning right down. All righty. So. All right, who's that? That's David Bowie. Um, I, I cried when he died, and I cried when Prince died. And it's funny, that combination, you know, I was 54 when uh, Prince died, but it felt like that's when my youth ended. It's like, those, those, they're gone, you know. It's called New Killer Star, which is the name of a Bowie tune. Every time the needle kisses the groove, the walls sing, holy, holy. The moth at the flame singes its whisper. The tape loops speak in tongues from their machine heads. Hello, space boy. You've torn your dress. There's nothing wrong. Can't afford the ticket back to Suffragette City. There's nothing wrong. All the young dudes are punch drug, drunk on your new arpeggios. What we thought was a void turns out to be a soundtrack. What we thought was a death turns out to be a field of new made stars. Guitar string theory explains everything perfectly if one smashes one's head through the troposphere and just listens. The new math is harder, but allows one to French kiss God. Your equations still make origami of the cosmos. You fold yourself into your gone persona like a chef folds vanilla into a batter made of flame. The auroras you inhabit glam the horizon Balloon animals tripping on a Fantasia by Aladdin saying, Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Your thousand light, your stare is the laser show at the Goblin King sing-along, a two-tone flash from the past. Even now, you incinerate us with the tastiest of hosannas, grill us to a grateful crisp. Ashes to ashes, Ziggy, dust to dust. Right, this is the last one, and this is in a form called a haibun. Um, and a haibun is, is, is an ancient Japanese form where a chunk of prose, um, usually a prose poem, is followed by a haiku that sort of explains, wraps up, riffs on the prose part. Um, this one's called Be Kind, Rewind. And the, uh, there are musical references in this one too, uh, mainly to the band Fishbone, um, which is the first thing I thought of when I saw this painting. So I knew Fishbone had to be in there. Be Kind, Rewind. To heed the arrow or to answer the ampersand. You know not, care not, ascend the down moonbeam to the uber-haunted boulevard, reduced to wreckage by subway screen time, doom-scrolled into a coffee craze and zombie lurching toward a dystopia brunch. You've been eaten by the algorithm till your edges are toast crusty, your eyes bloodshot Bloody Mary, the song in your head wearing frumpy A-line, black boots, a death-obsessed grovel in the gravel until the vultures come. You sentence your phone to 10 years of time out. Trip down food cart studded sidewalks. Let the weather have its way with you. Planes scream toward skyscrapers, but miss. And the cop on the corner shoots off only his mouth this time at the black kid who grabs his chest wide-eyed, then laughs uproariously. In the breakfast nook, someone shatters a plate, but there's a Hello Kitty microwave. The TV's a terrarium. Somebody says cardamom, and you're a golden doubloon in a flooded grotto set alight by a sunbeam through a crack in the roof of the world. 
The woman in the next booth is wearing lavender, scent, and sweater. Laughs like cat's feet on a harpsichord, while fishbone spills a psychedelic scopocalypse all over the air. In your chest, it's a party at ground zero. Cardiac unrest erupting in a riotous drip defib of blooming, like a syllable by Basquiat blossoming into a B-movie starring you. And here's the haiku. Heat not the arrow, a lit by a sunbeam be reduced to wreckage. Thank you. I was asked to, to submit a poem to an anthology, and she did the cover. And then I went on her website and looked at some of her work. And she shows all over the world. Um, why she wants to work with me, I have no idea, but I'm really grateful she does. And I just, so I just emailed her and said, you know, I love the cover you did for the anthology, and your paintings make me want to write. I said, would you want to maybe do a project, and she was super gung-ho, and now we, I've never actually met her yet, because she's in Toronto and I'm here, and we've had a pandemic going on, but we talk and email all the time, and she's just, her name's Lorette um, Luzajic, and if you, if you wanna, you can Google her and look at her art, which is always for sale, and some of it's, you know, foot square ones are relatively reasonable, probably not for a college student, but, but you know, 350 bucks or so, but she's having a two-for-one sale, because it's her 50th birthday. Long answer, but yeah, she's, we just kind of, it was just kind of fortuitous and we really hit it off. And, you know, we have about, we probably need about 10 more to be ready for, for a book or, you know, a gallery show or something. But it's, 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 it's really exciting to be kind of going inside the paintings and spelunking around and coming back. And, and the fact that she likes the poems and turns them into paintings is even more amazing to me. Anything else? Okay, well, um, there are the bookstores here. They have books. Um, I will sign them. Um, and I guess that's it. Thank you all so much for coming.